Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar, Artificial Intelligence for Decisions of Sport in Tissue Characterization in Indocene 9 Green and Near Infrared Endolaparoscopy. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You may have joined the presentation listening using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the telephone, just select phone call in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Ronan Cahill. Professor Ronan Cahill graduated MB, BAO, BCH honours from University College Dublin in 1997 and then completed his basic and specialist surgical training in Ireland gaining both MD by thesis, Health Research Board Clinical Research Fellow and FRCS by examination. Therefore, he was a clinical fellow at the IRCAD EITS Institute in Strasbourg, France from 2007 to 2008 before moving to the Oxford Radcliffe Hospitals as senior fellow and then consultant and senior clinical researcher from 2008 to 2010. Ronan returned to Ireland in 2010 as consultant general surgeon, specialist interest in collateral surgery at Bowman Hospital before taking up the position of professor at, of surgery at University College Dublin and the Mater Miss Victoria Hospital in June 2014. He is a recipient of both the Bennett and Millen Medals or CSI Millen Lecturer 2010 and was the ASGBI Robert Smith Lecturer in 2014. He has authored over 150 peer-reviewed publications, five book chapters and four national guidelines. He is an editorial board member of five index surgical journals, including Collateral Disease and the European Journal of Surgical Oncology and is a member of the SAGES Research Committee, SAGES Career Development Award recipient 2009. He has a major academic interest in surgical innovation and new technologies and active basic science, clinical and device development research partnerships, both nationally and internationally. I'd now like to welcome Professor Ronan Cahill. Uh, so, <clears throat> Megan, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thanks, Ron, for the invitation to present at this seminar series. Uh, this has been running for a couple of years and it's great to be part of it, thank you. Um, and I've been working with ICG for um, oh, a long time now, but it's getting into a very exciting phase. Firstly, I think because more people are using it, more people have access to the systems. Uh, the dye is more available in more places for people. Um, and I think also we're understanding much better what it is and what it isn't. And it's lovely to get to talk to you about what we think is important and how we're going about it. So. Um, to start, we're going to talk about uh, AI, decision support in surgery, and how this make, may help us um, understand better what we're seeing. And I guess everyone who sees anything about ICG sees videos like this. You see uh, lovely areas of striking green fluorescence developing through the bowel. And of course, you can see that in a black and white view as, as well. And the goal here is to really make sure that we're all seeing things, that the same things, and that we're able to see something more, more than the naked eye can see. So that uh, this is not augmented reality, this is reality, it's the dye perfusing through the tissues, and that that can usefully add to our decision making during operations. And we're seeing that indeed it can, and there's a lot of um, prospective series now, uh, small randomized trials, that show that we can maybe reduce anastomotic leaks at surgery. And the idea here is this uh, vision effect type of cerebration, that if you see something, you can then act on it, and then the actions affect what you see, and you can build up a whole sequence of rather complex operations through a series of small steps. The key bit, though, is are we all seeing the same thing? Because the goal here is to try and improve global outcomes uh, un universally, everywhere an operation is done, everywhere a camera system is used. And what's really important is that we do all see the same thing. And all surgery, certainly all minimally invasive surgery, is based on visualization and then decision making. And here's a picture of a duck, but some people see a rabbit. And it's just 
indic indicative of that we can all look at the same screen but sometimes we can see different things in it and this is work that Niall Hardy has done. Niall's doing a PhD in the area of uh, tissue characterization with a AI in, in ICG. And he's done this, lo this lovely study looking at uh, dynamic videos with ICG coming in and, and then showing different people these videos and seeing do they all make the same judgment about where this maximum area of perfusion sufficiency is. Uh, and it's really great because this hasn't been just done in photographs, it's been done on videos. And what you're seeing here is the preparation, the proximal transection site in patients having colorectal operations. And the ICG is given to inform that we're making the right area of transection. And by showing these uh, videos to 40 people, some of whom have a lot of experience uh, in surgery and some less so, and some of whom have a lot of experience in ICG and some less so, you can see that although they're all watching the same videos, blinded to the clinical outcome, the dots show you where they actually all would have placed their stapler. So there's quite a degree of variance, even though we all tend to think of fluorescence as being this binary decision support that we should all know where the signal is strongest to it. And when you look to kind of quantify that in arbitrary units to account for the difference of perspective in videos, you can see that people with experience, that's the group here in red, tend to sort of make more similar decisions than people without experience in fluorescence. Um, so the goal, of course, is that, you know, if we're all interpreting it this correctly to the same way, you should see much narrower um, variance in those decision making. Um, interestingly, when we, even we, we asked these people before looking at the videos, what do they think the ideal number of cases to do with ICG before you really felt you were competent and even proficient about it? Many of them felt that, in fact, you needed uh, quite a considerable number. Uh, certainly more than 10, and some people even thought more than 50 cases would be important to, to, to really understand. And that's, that's a little different than the old adage of see one and do one and teach one. Um, and it sort of does suggest that this is some nuance is needed in interpreting the type of uh, Im images that are coming up. We know that surgery is a time of high cognitive burden. And it's really important that we're going to be able to make information easier for surgeons to see and assimilate during the operation, not just keep challenging them with different colors of pictures and asking them to what, what they think about now. And when you look a little more uh, statistically at what this, this type of inter-observer variation is like, you find that the agreement is really imperfect, including even among the expert groups, um, and certainly too among the broader group of users to it, that there's a lot of variance in interpretation of the inflow of ICG coming in on the screen. And maybe it's not surprising, this is anastomosis being, being made, a colorectal anastomosis. The ICG is being given. And you see there's, there's lots of different things happening on the screen. Now, all surgeons will be looking up at the anastomosis, but you see the small bowel has gone green earlier, then the colon has, the proximal colon goes a bit green differently to the uh, distal side of it. And uh, there's lots of information coming and all of that can be useful because you're seeing uh, operated bits of bowel versus un unoperated bit portions of bowel. And it would be great to um, try and make the best use of this. Now, it's hard for humans to look everywhere on the screen at the same time and remember what does it look like now compared to what it did look like a few seconds ago, or even what it looked like compared to other people. There's, that's, that's something really that computers can be very good at. And computer vision is able to uh, carefully study different aspects of the screen at the same time with memory of what they look like. Um, this is another interesting one. This is Jeffrey Daly's done some work now and we'll, we'll talk about his work again a bit afterwards. This is the bowel being taken out during a right hemicolectomy. You see the small bowel on the right and you see the colon on the left and the tumors, uh, the, the, the uh, tumors off screen. So when the ICG is given, we're expecting it around the middle of the screen that that will be our transition point between uh, perfusion and not perfusion because we've divided the mesentery up to that point on either side of the bowel, preparing it to, in order to make the anastomosis. And you see that green does indeed go up to that point. But you see on the left-hand side of the screen that in fact, uh, it slowly starts to extend on down past that point. And um, if we fast forward the video too, you will see migration of the dye even on the small bowel side on the right hand side of the screen. So it's important, of course, that we're looking at dynamic changes, but also 
uh, to make best sense of this, there's, we, we have to uh, look at it at certain times as well. So if you if you came and looked a bit later, you might choose a more distal transaction point than that earliest inflow of ICG has has um, has indicated is the best perfusion aspects of it. So the inter-observer variation, the fact that lots of things happening on the screen, the fact that it's time dependent, really all is building a case for uh, having some uh, objectification of the glow patterns that are being seen during operations. Uh, and you can see this, uh, I suppose, this, ph this ph phenomenon well in intercorporally as well. This is, a, again, a, a patient having a uh, left hand collectomy this time. You can see the small bowel goes green, the proximal colon goes green, the blue mark was where I thought to make the transection point. But in fact, uh, it even although that's the early on, that's where it goes greenest first, you can see later on in, in, in a few seconds afterwards, the dye does start to extend on down distally to it. So uh, it'd be helpful to have some on-screen display to give some information about that. And this is particularly important, we think, uh, maybe to try and exploit fluorescence in cancer work. Mostly what's happening when we give a dye to for cancer work, uh, some hours before the operation, what we're hoping to do is come back and see it at around this time, when the tumour in the centre is bright and when the rest of the tissue is not bright. Uh, but we know there's lots of false positives with this. That the dye has been exposed to the area of tumours. Some of it's leaking into the tumour all the time while it's been cleared out of the normal tissues around it. And trying to just know the exact time to come in and look at uh, your fluorescent dye can be a bit challenging, particularly when uh, theatre lists are, are often subject to, lot, to lots of variation. But what's happening earlier on in it, of course, is the dye is going through all the tissues, firstly to the normal tissue, um, it might probably be slow to get into the tumour in the first place. We, we know this well, the tumours have uh, imperfect and inefficient blood supplies into them, and they have increased interstitial pressure and, and, a, and, a, and a variety of other abnormalities that make them quite morphologically distinct than the normal tissue around it. But that over time, uh, the dye will leak into the tumour, um, start to occupy the intercellular spaces, and maybe even get into the cells themselves. Uh, while it's also clearing out of the dye, of the tissues around it. And that, although we might maybe wait, want to just see when everything is simplified for human interpretation, computers are probably really able to make sense of all that complex information that's happening at earlier time frames. And if we build in some sense of the kinetic or dynamic understanding of the tissue behavior, uh, we might be better at uh, detecting what tissue is what, when we see it uh, at the time of any endoscopic encounter. So I'm, I'm going to show you what this means. This is a patient with a sigmoid cancer who's gotten the dye some hours be before we're looking at it. And you see that there is some trapping of the ICG near the tumour on the cirrhosal surface. Uh, you know, it's also trapped in mucosally. It can stay some hours afterwards. And uh, this type of phenomenon has been reported before. You can see it here microscopically. Um, here's another case of a right hemicolectomy. Uh, again, the ICG has been given a couple of hours before this, this time point, and this person had some enlarged lymph nodes in their mesocolon, and you'll see here that they also have taken up the fluorescence to it. So this seems really helpful, except for the fact that actually there's quite a lot of false positives of the dye around the tissue. That's it up in the primary. But if we scanned around the camera, you'd see a number of sites in the omentum and the mesocolon which also have trapped some dye, and that areas of, of inflammation, perhaps maybe fatty tissue, uh, can also take up the, the, the dye. And we see this uh, both when ICG is used and even when more selective fluorophores, which are now entering early phase clinical trials are used, they all have this rather high false positive rate because uh, there's other ways dyes can move in tissue. And if you're just looking for a snapshot observation, some hours or a couple of days after you've given the dye, I think there is always going to be that tendency to uh, to have misinterpretations of the type of tissues that are being seen. So if you look a bit earlier though, and colon cancer is a good model for this because uh, well, very often end endoscopy is used early on to make the diagnosis. Um, and of course, uh, we, we can see the tumor without having to look through tissues at it when we see the endoscopic surface. So here's a rectal cancer. The video is a little bit speeded up. And if we give the dye, you see, just like in the diagram, it gets to the normal tissue very quickly, doesn't penetrate into the tumour initially, 
but you'll see uh, even after maybe 10, 12 minutes or so, that that flip has happened, that the dye now has seeped into the tumour um, and cleared from the normal tissues around it. So using some colour segmentation, which is part of the, uh, the striker pinpoint system, you can see rather high concentrations of ICG in it, but still may be prone to false positives if you haven't looked to see all of the previous time about what was it doing until it got to the point of maximum concentration. Uh, a benign tumour is looks looks differently to it. Here, the villus adenoma with the rectum proved to be fully but benign after we excised it by a transanal excision. And you'll see that the dye given systemically behaves in a, in a different way. In fact, here it's gone into the tumour before it's gone into the normal tissue, but it does get into the normal tissue then for quite quickly after, after you see it there. Um, and it will then also clear from both those tissues, the abnormal tumour versus the normal tissue, relatively similar because the dye is able to move in and out of the tissue, different to that rather chaotic tissue architecture that's associated with the cancer. Um, now this is Jeffrey's uh, work looking with MATLAB analysis of the patterns of flow within the tumours. And if you look uh, frame by frame using MATLAB analysis of uh, the grayscale pictures, you can generate enormous amounts of data and you see these trends being quite different uh, from red versus blue versus green. But if it's hard to show people pictures of different colors during operations, it's impossible to imagine just showing people graphs and, uh, and thinking they can work out the differences between them. But there are differences between the behaviors. And if you start looking at uh, the rates of, of inflow, the rates of outflow, the times of peaks and uh, the gradients of the slopes, there's a number of areas where, where significance can be found that the fluorescent dye flowing through a cancer is, has a significantly different pattern than fluorescent dye flowing through areas of normal tissue. And both those things are in the screen at the same time. Uh, you can make some sense of what you're seeing in the tissue ahead of waiting for bi bi biopsies to, to come back. And that's where it's not just computer vision, but machine learning and artificial intelligence should be able to uh, look at these slopes, calculate very quickly what they're like compared to each other, an area of normal versus an area of abnormal, even compare those slopes to other people having had the same type of uh, interrogation, and then come back with probability prediction scores as to whether you're seeing is a cancer or not a cancer uh, of the primary tumour. But um, nothing we're seeing here is necessarily specific to colorectal cancer, it could apply to other tumours too. And, uh, and also nothing is specific here to primary tumours because other metastatic deposits will have similar types of uh, tissue organisation. So to make use of this, you have to develop careful tracking. It's terribly important you're following the same pixel over time, and there can be movement that, that you'll see. The cameraman might move the camera a bit, uh, the tissue might move due to respiration or maybe even paracelsis of the bowel. And it's very important if you're going to ascribe values to the parts of tissue, that you're sure it's the same part of the tissue uh, that you're seeing over time. And uh, although maybe you might uh, get a lot of information in the first 30 to 50 seconds of the ICG coming into the tissue, you might want to watch it a bit longer because the, the longer you can observe the, the, the dye patterns in the tissue, the more information you're likely to get. So uh, we've been working with IBM research group and uh, this kind of uh, optical flow methodology for uh, following pixels in videos um, is, really, has, is really very, very important in order to make sure that what we're seeing is correct. Now this is happening in the white light view, but the fluorescence is happening in the near infrared view. And you're measuring then the intensity of the fluorescent signal coming in in the, in the near infrared view while tracking in the white light view uh, using things like surface feature detection. So it's also terribly important that this isn't just post hoc analysis of videos. And uh, it's important this is able to happen in real time because surgeons need information in moments. It is really going to be useful for decision making and sequencing of the person's care from that moment of, of first, uh, first endoscopic encounter. So uh, while we have been doing work on post hoc video analysis, it's really important to us that this is applicable to uh, the theater cases. And here you see this happening in real time. So on the left hand side of the screen, what's happening is I'm picking areas of interest, areas that I know to be abnormal and areas I know to be normal, um, and maybe a couple of areas that I'm not quite sure about as we look at this ulcer inside the rectum. 
then the ICG has been given just just a systemic dose of of, uh, of, of ICG, and we're going to track those areas uh, using the the um, computer vision algorithms. And you'll see in the right hand side of the screen uh, the fluorescent signal coming in on the endoscopic stack. And you'll see then in the middle of the screen uh, the um, the graphing of those regions of interest. There's a couple of seconds of delay between the two because there is a few um, uh, wired con connections to go from the screen into the laptop. And uh, that, but that lag time we can uh, we we can manage. But what you'll see uh, you'll see happening is that these graphs then are being drawn of all the different regions of interest, and that's presenting the information back in a way that could allow uh, classification of each of those boxes that were drawn. So uh, what happens then is the uh, the program is able to make sense of those curves, and then assign uh, classification or categorization to the areas on the screen. And what we're interested in is, is what's normal tissue, what's cancer, uh, and what could be a benign abnormality lesion of it. So uh, these are the graphs being drawn of those boxes, one, two, three, and four. Two looks very abnormal, one might be on the boundary, um, and zero certainly is getting back towards more normal type of tissue. But if you, the more you let it run, the longer the information is going to be. But even within about uh, you know 45 seconds or so, uh, the, there can be enough information garnered about those slopes to make sense of uh, what the categories are going to look like. And that's the type of display that we're currently getting at the moment. The percentages being uh, probability scores of, of what this lesion might be. Uh, then the tumour was re resected, and uh, it, this this case was indeed proven to be a cancer. So even this is pretty cool, but it's even rather crude too, because we would like to move away from having to draw boxes. We would like to just be able to analyse the entire screen as, as you're watching it, uh, and then allow that sort of uh, classification to come up with 2D boundary maps, and maybe even 3D models of uh, depth of the tumour, because it, the, there is an awful lot of information that is coming from the screen, it's just limited as to uh, how much a human can actually make judgments uh, based on all that information, particularly when you have a lot of other things to think about during, during surgeries. Um, so this is kind of where we're at at the moment. Although we have a bigger patient series now, the initial learning set is based on 20 patients, uh, and drawing boxes in different parts of the screen gives you maybe 400 regions of interest in those uh, videos of cases. These are just non-special, non non-selected cases coming in having uh, the care in the usual way and we're giving ICG, we're looking at the primaries and we're seeing what the predictive value of the, the ICG plus the machine learning um, artificial intelligence prediction is compared with the ultimate pathological uh, specimen and analysis in the standard way. And what you find is that the per region of interest, uh, the the accuracy rates is, is in the region of 85 per, per, percent. But we know that tumours will, of course, be heterogeneous in their, in their appearances, and there might be areas of benign or mixed uh, neoplastic appearances. Not all of it might be cancer. But when you look, as we uh, tend to treat patients at a patient level accuracy, it gets up to 95%, which really shows quite a discriminative pipeline in this small set of, uh, of patients. This isn't... Uh, deep learning type of AI where you need a million images, or basically you need to show the computer every possible configuration that might ever have been seen. And you're hoping that the next case that comes along is more like them rather than, than being something different from the first time. Uh, this type of AI is biophysics inspired because we, we know thanks to lots of investigators uh, an awful lot about the ICG dye. We know an awful lot about the tissues that we're looking at. We know an awful lot about what cancer looks like and behaves like. So you don't need the in, enormous uh, image data banks in order to uh, get quite accurate prediction calculations when you're building in that type of kinematic information. And when you're looking at videos, which are 30 frames per, per, per second, and you look for a couple of minutes at it, you are generating very large data sets on each individual person. Um, you know, of course, this doesn't just have to apply to the primary lesion. Uh, this was an interesting patient who had had uh, three times recurrent colonic cancer, started off with the cecum, then there was a, a mental deposit, uh, and then there was a further deposit on the peritoneum. 
And when the PET, count, the PET scan came back uh, a fourth time to showing a hot spot on the gallbladder, we assume that area of abnormality was likely to be uh, a cancer. We often use um, our, our, um, our likelihoods based on the imaging beforehand to guide us interoperatively. But when we're looking uh, at the case and we give ICG to it, what you'll see is uh, really it flows in very uniformly across the gallbladder, including into that area of abnormality to it. Uh, although it all happens really very quickly. And uh, if you apply then uh, the AI classification, so again, we're drawing boxes, areas we know to, that look abnormal, areas that look are normal. Um, and then we're trying to uh, measure, quantify, and understand the differences between the behaviors of the tissue based on the flow of ICG through it. Um, and you let that run. It's, it's, it, uh, it, the clicking along is, is frame by frame analysis rates. Um, you can get up to your uh, prediction classifications, suggesting that actually the area that would look most abnormal really is behaving much more closely to the areas that are normal compared to what other patients who've had this type of approach for abnormality have shown. But what we did take out is gallbladder, and it did show a uh, benign inflammatory lesion, the cap of his gallbladder. So that's really, I guess, what I really wanted to share with you guys. The importance of, uh, you know, realizing that this, any operation we do, and any equipment we use, whether it's laparoscopic instrumentation or robotic instrumentation, are only ever as good as the, the decision making that we make in, in a case. And there are variables in those decisions uh, from time to time. It's very difficult to always make the perfect decision every single time. Um, there is a lot of advances in, in computer processing power and in AI algorithms. And there are different types of AI algorithms which can be applied even to relatively small data sets. Um, video in surgery is a terribly useful source of information, not just the video, but the linking that to some of the patient metadata and also to the surgical insights, the surgeon's thinking at the time of the operation can really build up quite powerful data sets. And uh, it would be really great to start to share that raw material bet between us and uh, really make fluorescence guidance a very, very powerful tool to support our decision making. And while this is mostly about ICG, whatever other dyes might also come about can all probably be helped uh, in our interpretation by these types of technologies because they're just we're all we're ever trying to do is look at contrasts and differences in behavior between uh, one area versus another across the screen over time. So Megan I'm going to finish the talk there uh, really interested to hear what the audience might think about it I'm really happy to take any questions either now or, um, or, in, or into the future. The work I'm mostly talking about is going to be in the British Journal of Surgery I hope in the next week or two, we're expecting the proofs this week, and uh, it'd be really great to uh, be part of a discussion uh, about how really this becomes useful for surgeons um, everywhere that we are operating. So thank you very much for the invitation to present. Great, thank you, Professor Cahill. We're now going to begin answering the questions submitted during today's presentation. As a quick reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. Um, we've had a number of questions come in, Professor Cahill. So our first question is, do you use any man magnification during surgery? If yes, which system? And if no, would this help? Oh yeah, no, we don't use any mag magnification. I mean, I'm a GI surgeon, so mostly we're just using the laparoscope, uh, standard laparoscopes. In this instance, it's been the uh, striker one. Um, so we're not magnifying the tissue really as as, as such. Uh, I mean, I, I certainly know in, in neurosurgery and in plastics surgery, people do use um, optical mag magnification systems, but all of this is just really based on what the laparoscopic display might be. Uh, certainly, I would think this could work with, with the other systems too. N nothing about this is particularly proprietary to the camera systems, uh, which are all, all of them really do a pretty good job of creating the image of the tissue. And then when there's, uh, whether it's ICG or ALA 
with fluorescence. They're all doing a very good job of sensitively detecting that and presenting that up for the human surgeon expert to, to interpret. So uh, all, all we're doing is looking at changing contrast on the screen wherever that screen picture has come from. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is, has your AI technology been incorporated into any commercially available NIR camera instruments? Uh, no, because uh, you know, I mean, it's still it's still it's still in development phase. What that, what we're talking about is the first report of that first test set of cases. Uh, you need to really start to apply that prospectively over over um, over a larger number of, of patients. We think we 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 think a couple of hundred, but yeah, it is interesting where this would sit. I mean, you know, it could sit in the camera head. Uh, it could sit in a adjunctive box like a like like a laptop that you're sitting there. Uh, it could happen up in the cloud. What's important really is just that the uh, video information is accessible to the AI algorithms to it, and um, it is really it is really ter terribly interesting where we want to situate that video interpretation. The key bit I think is surgeons get the information back in moments. Whenever they need it, it should be available to them pretty quickly. I think that's why ICG has worked well for bowel perfusion, particularly, and maybe not so well for other types of things, perhaps like biliary mapping, which require a bit of pre-dosing beforehand to it. Really, the key test of this type of technology uh, is going to be when you're stuck, is this really a good way of asking a friend to do it? But it, it is really great if people might be interested in, in participating in, uh, in the development and validation of it, because not only do we have to really show that the technology is going to be accurate, we also have to know, is it useful for surgeons? Are they able to assimilate this type of information? And what do they want to see? Some people might like to see the graphs because you have to trust that, that something is happening that makes sense to us before we're going to really ever um, change the patient's uh, outcome based on, a, on, on supplementary information. Um, for other people might like traffic light systems, you know, that uh, are even just a check of kind of, are you sure, would you think again, or are there enough reasons about this case that makes you think differently from it? So quite how that makes sense to a clinical expert audience like this, or, or like we know are, 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 are providing care, is a really great point. And we'd really love uh, to be part of any group or include people in our work uh, to try and sort of really say, well, how is this going to be most most usefully used? Great, thank you. Next question is, why are your area of interest boxes different sizes? Oh yeah, we're just playing around. You know, like, it's, I mean, you're you're just trying to draw um, an area of you know that you think represents the thing that you're seeing. Now, you, we are going to stay away from obvious uh, art, art, artifacts. So if there's a, a lot of blood in an area. We don't really want to draw, draw, draw the box there, but we are. And we're trying to pick a place too that's going to be relatively stable in view over the period of time. But, but I mean, you're absolutely right that you, you know, I mean, it is rather ar arbitrary whether you draw a big box or a small box. And you really don't want to be drawing boxes at all. You just want the whole screen analyzed. Um, so that's probably either drawing one big box that's the whole screen, are you know thousands of little boxes that really map to uh, to to a, a, a pixel or voxel type of area to, to it. But we're just really just uh, eyeballing it at the moment, and just trying to make the boxes roughly fit to areas that we think uh, make make sense. But we're fortunate in in having a good collaboration. There's there's chemists involved in the Royal College of Surgeons. Uh, we, we, there's surgeons involved both in hospitals and with universities appointments, particularly at the University College in Dublin. Um, and then there's very smart, capable mathematicians and computer scientists in IBM. And all that's been brought together by a, by a government uh, grant to, to fund this, this type of work. The purpose being to bring, you know, bring people together from different sectors, different backgrounds, because that's really where most innovation tends to happen, is the application of things working well in other sectors into a new sector of use to it. But, uh, and we do need to include users, uh, people who, who, you know, because some people might like to draw, to draw their own boxes, or some people might like to draw a circle. Uh, and all that type of, of, 
I suppose, input is terribly important because this we really are very sincere about making this useful because that's really the only point of doing research that something tangibly useful could come out of it. So fantastic if people want to uh, comment or criticize or try it out or whatever makes sense. Great, thank you. Does the ICG gain setting affect the quantitative analysts? Ah, so this is really interesting. Um, the fluorescence intensity we're seeing is what's on the screen. So uh, this isn't a direct feed from the sensor that's in the camera. And definitely that sensor in the camera is undergoing some processing in the system, in the camera, in the, in the computer that's already attached to, in order to make that lovely picture that appears on the screen. And certainly the different systems have different methods of doing that so. So it is difficult to get the raw data output from every system. Some systems do let you do it. Uh, Quest, we've got access to a, a research uh, system from, from Quest, which does provide the raw data re readout to it. So we are doing some work uh, with stereotactic telemetry to try to understand how important the, uh, the distance from the camera tip to the tissue the pitch and yaw of it, the type of rotation to it, might make a difference from it, because there is probably a different a difference, uh, all right, uh, mathematically between the raw images versus what we're seeing on the screen. But on the other hand, really, those pictures on the screen are definitely reflective of what's happening in the biological tissue. They're definitely, I mean, people are definitely able to make very good decisions and improved decisions based on the ICG flowing in and out of it. So I think although we do need to look at that and understand a little more about how the systems are working, um, which, you know, the companies are terribly helpful with this type, 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 type of work, but, you know, haven't necessarily, you know, the, the key goal of this, of camera systems has always been to make the best, most beautiful image for the human to interpret it. And that's what they're designed to do. They haven't really been made in order to allow um, interrogative analysis by, by mathematical programs looking at it. So, you know, it may, it, it could easily be quite sufficient that, um, in for the first step anyway, that the screen information is quite sufficient and that it's a human surgeon expert machine collaboration rather than actually the computer trying to come up with all of the decisions making. But you do want to include uh, all of the types of information that we have coming before the radiologist's opinion, the gastroenterologist's and endoscopy opinion, the surgeon's view of it, and to try and add some value to that matrix rather than setting up a whole, uh, uh, you know, a whole other way of doing it that doesn't include those aspects to it. And then over time, you can find out what really has been the most useful bit to it. So I think, yeah, we are getting deeper into the um, into this science of the fluorescence intensity that we're seeing. In some ways, it's a surrogate marker of the ICG concentrations of the tissues, but there's really, this is a, this is photon flux that has been seen on the screen. Um, but maybe we don't need to get quite too deep into it. And Megan, it'd be lovely with some of these questions if I could ask questions back, because we'd love, I'd love to, I mean, these are very uh, probing questions and, be, and people ask them probably have very good thoughts about it too. And it would be lovely to, uh, if, if, if probably not possible in this format, but it would be great to hear uh, hear hear more from the people asking asking the questions too. Yes, absolutely. I can save all of these questions, and perhaps you can respond after the webinar in the coming upcoming days. Yeah. Perfect. Um. So the next question that we have is: Do we know what particular characteristics of the fluorescence intensity profile of each ROI are predictive of cancer? Um, well, th that's Jeffrey's work, uh, which um, other people have been kind of helping with, with uh, too, of course. If you, um, if I, I, don't, I don't know if I can if I can go back to it. If you just if you draw these curves without it going into a black box, you can see uh, certain areas of difference on it. Now you uh, you do where you know this this we, we've taken a number of parameters that have already been described, including in uh, people who've done a lot of work with fluorescence. 
but you can uh, separate out those curves into a number of things that can then be, then you can do statistics on them to try and work it out. Now, there's always going to be a, you know, a, a human choice about what things sort of seem to make most, most sense about it. And one of the values of machine learning is you can look at every possible difference by loads of different statistical methods at the same time to it. But we are making um, a mathematical curve based on the likely parameters. Um, here, here, here are some in the bottom part of the screen. And that's really what we're tracking over time. But with bigger learning sets, I'm sure there'll be other differences that come up of it. But, uh, you know, with, it's important, I think, that we're not all just doing this in, uh, in black box and seeing what the computer makes of it, but that we also, in parallel, do do uh, old-fashioned uh, discovery and exploratory work on it. And you can see that there's a number of areas here of statistical significance, which fit with the upslopes and downslopes of the curves um, to at least, I suppose, provide some credibility to our understanding that this, what's coming out of the AI system is, uh, is also likely to be true. So, uh, I mean, there, there, that's some differences there. There's, uh, we'll share the paper widely um, for anyone who's interested in it. And really great to hear what other people's thoughts of what might be different or not. I mean, big data in itself doesn't tell you anything. It just tells you about the bias of the things that you've been looking at. So any interpretation of big data, I, I think, needs lots of people looking at it too. And uh, expert surgeons are terrific at telling you what they uh, believe to be probably worth basing decisions on versus things that might just be arbitrary other aspects with it. So as the work goes on with more um, numbers of videos, with more uh, use cases, including just intestinal perfusion, uh, with the transparency of the data being done, not just building up this huge data pile and then seeing the black box makes of it, uh, I think we can probably get further faster than uh, with more likelihood of it being true than otherwise. Grace, thank you. Um, something in from one of our other attendees. Congratulations on your presentation. Three weeks ago, I attended the pre-presentation of L Vision System in from Medtronic in Mexico. It has a feature similar to what you have just shown us. Are you experienced with this? Yeah, I mean, that's a beautiful system. Uh, it really makes a lovely image on the screen. But they're doing something a bit different. I mean, what they are, basically doing is you get a screenshot of the time of interest and then you're able to uh, press a button or even it's a touch screen I think sometimes you're able to look at the relative differences between the point of maximum fluorescence on the screen versus any other place that you're interested in. They're not looking at the kinematic change of fluorescence in that place over time. They could, I mean, I mean anyone can do you know this is uh, there's some very there is some very smart uh, mathematical work in this particularly the pixel tracking but you know all of the systems the, all this this type of work is this video analysis is of course uh, applicable to any image stream that's coming into it so the elevation does give you a beautiful high definition screen what I like about it is it's a system that doesn't even that, that doesn't pretend it's not a computer it's quite clearly it has a windows operating system and it clearly is a computer um, whereas many other systems seems to be, you know, it's not that obvious. It's just a camera and then it's presenting it on the screen. And I think for a couple of decades now, we haven't really made as much use of that computer that sits there than before. But I think the Elevision one, which is designed in mind to be a cancer imaging a system, uh, ideally with, I think, with that type of fluorescence aspects, has mostly tried which, which loads of people do, and it, it could really work very, very well, have mostly assumed that you're going to know the exactly perfect time to look, and then all you have to do is to discriminate the areas of brightness at that specific time. They're not really looking in that sort of uh, chem chemical way or that um, simple discovery way of what was happening between those, those, those times. Um, and that's, I think, what's really fundamentally different about this type of approach versus all the rest of the type of approach which assumes you're going to get more accuracy through targeted agents alone. And I don't think that's 
quite true. I think we're going to get to that ideal fluorescence guided surgery by including expert human interpretation, um, lovely camera visualization, smart uh, computer vision supported type of work. And then yes, of course, a targeted die because the type of decisions we're making are terribly important and you want to get them as close to 100% as you can. But I don't think it's fair to let expect a dye or a drug to do all that work. When we know that there's lots of variations between tumors in, in the tumor itself, between different types of tumors, between different types of, of people, lots of difference in the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. And I worry about anything that's subject to timing that you have to give on a certain day of the week and you have to have your list on another day of the week. Um, I mean, my list today finished at a different time than what I was expecting to. So I think really surgery is probably best when we're able to be in control of everything during the case and that information, you know, the drug can be given, seen, understood, interpreted within moments, which maybe I thought wasn't possible. But just in the last couple of years, I'm really starting to feel that this is very possible by allowing combinations of all those type of things uh, to come into your decision making processes. And surgeons are good at complexity. Uh, so I think we've nothing to be afraid of by including that kind of that expert view alongside uh, smart chemistry, smart dyes. But maybe you do want your drug to be attuned to your AI algorithm, perhaps. And maybe we don't need to see all those changing colors happening in front of us. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid that is all the time we have for today. And any unanswered questions um, will be forwarded onto Professor Cahill um, for him to answer in the coming days, okay? Now, I'd like to thank you, Professor Ronan Cahill, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation and we, will, we would appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24, 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. On behalf of the International Society of Fluorescence Guided Surgery, with grant funding from Diastic Green and our presenter, Professor Ronan Cahill, thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.